Uh, quiz, quiz time here. Quick, quick question. How many of you are thinking, Advent? Jesus in the garden? What's going on here? Anybody slightly confused? All right. It's a fair thing if you are. It is the season of Advent. It is a season when we commonly talk about preparation. What must we do to prepare? There's another aspect to the season of Advent, though, that we need to keep in mind even while we do all that we do to prepare. And that is sometimes the only thing that we can do, or maybe the most important thing that we can do, is simply be present and pay attention. Jesus took Peter, James, and John into a, a deeper spot in the garden so that they could sit with him and watch while he prayed. He wanted them to simply attend to him in his time of need. And while there are many things that each of us will no doubt find ourselves doing, occupying your time within this Advent season, don't forget to take the time to simply attend to Jesus, to be there, and to be open to whatever God might be showing you in this season. If you'd like to think a little bit more about that, I shared a few thoughts on that in our weekly devotion. You can find on the uh, website there. Maybe think about that a little bit more. For now, we're going to turn our attention to our message for today. And before I do that, I'm going to ask you to do something. I always ask you to do something, but I'm like double, double, double serious about it today. Take out your Bibles. A lot of times I say, take out your Bibles and follow along. And I see like three people. Wayne opens up his Bible. I won't embarrass anybody. I see like three people take out their Bible. You will get a lot, lot more out of this if you take out your Bible and follow along as we work our way through our passage today. And if that just doesn't work for you, then at least go home afterwards and read through it a time or two. All right. With that said, now I know, I know that not everybody in the the room here is a sports fan. I know many of you are sports fans, one sport or another, but even if you're not a sports fan, I think most people are familiar, at least with the idea of top plays. Because if you're just watching your normal local weekly news, oftentimes you'll see a little teaser for the sports section coming up in just a minute, back after commercial with tonight's top plays. And everybody knows what top plays are about, right? Whether it's on ESPN or your local sports, or your, your local broadcast, it, it's not uncommon to see a little spotlight of top plays of the day or of the week. Sometimes in a single sport, sometimes in a variety of sports. Now when we consider the Bible, we know it is God's Word, correct? Amen? It, this is God's Word. But truth be told, everyone has their favorite books, their favorite characters, their favorite stories, their favorite verses. You could make up a top ten, probably in each of those categories, if you spent some time. But every now and then, something comes along... Something unexpected comes along and something new cracks the top ten. At least for a little time, something really stands out. Something surprising, something gives us a, a top play, so to speak, when we weren't expecting it. That was my experience this week with the passage that we have today. I, I, I found that little phenomenon going on. I have my top scriptures, my top Bible characters, etc. But here was one that I had not expected. Wow! Really spoke. What we have today is we have a word from a prophet to guide us and to instruct us. Now that is not too uncommon to have a word from a prophet to guide or to instruct, but the thing is this is not from one of the biggies. This is not Isaiah. This is not Jeremiah or Elijah or Ezekiel. Our prophet today who gives us this word is Habakkuk. Habakkuk. How familiar are you with Habakkuk? Let me tell you how familiar I am with Habakkuk. I spelled it differently about six different times and Joyce was asking me, wait a minute, is that one B or two Bs? Unless you have intentionally read through the entire Bible in one way or another, there's a very good chance you never have read anything from Habakkuk. And I 
would say that even if you have intentionally read through the entire Bible and you've read through Habakkuk, there's a very good chance you don't remember anything from Habakkuk. How many of you can quote me a verse from the book of Habakkuk? If you do, I'm going to sit down. Okay. <laughs> there are actually a couple really, really good gems in this book. Before we look at that, let's just answer a question or two. Who was Habakkuk? What do we know? What do we know about him? Well, not much. Habakkuk was one of the later prophets. He was contemporary with Jeremiah. Habakkuk speaks and writes to the people of Judah. So this is divided kingdom. This is late in the divided kingdom. He's speaking to the faithful who remained around Jerusalem in that southern part of the kingdom. In general, the kingdom is deteriorating. Things have been going downhill for quite a while. And the few faithful that still tried to follow God would have been confused by all that is unfolding and wondering what in the world is going on. Habakkuk, as I looked at Habakkuk, though, Habakkuk is a little bit unique, I think, amongst all of the prophets. We say he spoke or he wrote to Judah. Maybe your study Bible says that he wrote or he spoke or his audience was Judah. Uh, but strictly speaking, the book of Habakkuk shows us a conversation not with Habakkuk and Judah, or not a lecture directed at Judah, but it shows us a conversation between Habakkuk and God. This is a book that has a back and forth between Habakkuk and God. As such, it reminds me a little bit, a little bit of the book of Job. You know the story of Job? Whole bunch of bad things happened to Job. And Job complained. And Job complained. And Job complained some more. If you're having trouble sleeping, sometimes Job can help to put you to sleep. Because he complains more and more. He complains, he complains, he complains. His friends try to straighten him out. But he complains, he complains, he complains, he complains. He complains complaints until finally God sets him straight. When Habakkuk, Habakkuk complains, here's the thing, God answers right away. Habakkuk complains, God answers. Habakkuk complains again, and God answers Habakkuk a second time. And then finally we see a rather lengthy prayer from Habakkuk. Uh, three chapters, that's it. That's the whole book. As I said, if you, if you, if you don't want to read along as we, we go through this today, go home and read it. You can read the book of Habakkuk in just a little bit. It's, it's a small little book, but full of so much. Let's take some time and work our way through the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk begins with Habakkuk complaining. <laughs> That's like your favorite person to talk to, isn't it? The complainer. <laughs> oh boy. Habakkuk begins complaining. Verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you. Violence! But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Complain, 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 complain. What is Habakkuk complaining about? Well, it continues, destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. There is the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous and justice is perverted. So there is a real legitimate reason that Habakkuk is complaining. Now understand, all that he's complaining about, all that he is upset about, is, is evil in Judah. It's one thing to be complaining about what you see over there. Look at them. Look how wrong they are. Look how nasty that is. He's complaining about the wrong, about the evil that is in Judah. He's got a lot on his mind, doesn't he? Very often we see people complain. You look through the Psalms, and there's a whole lot of Psalms that are a whole lot of complaint. Lord, help, save, what's wrong with these people? Here in Habakkuk, Habakkuk complains, and right away, God answers. And I'm just going to give you a little paraphrase here to start out. God answering Habakkuk kind of amounts to this. Habakkuk's been complaining about all that's evil, about all that's wrong. And God essentially says, 
Watch this. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the Babylonians. Check this out. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days you would not believe. This sounds like what we might say to somebody if we're talking to them. This is God speaking to Habakkuk. You won't believe this. Even if you're told, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. In case... You forget, Babylonians there, they were not nice people to Israel or to Judah. They were outsiders. They were ruthless. They were evil. It was, it was like the exact opposite of following God. And, and God goes on then to describe these people that he's going to use to deal with the evil that Habakkuk sees in Judah. So you can't say that God comes up with this plan and that God starts this thing out and doesn't realize who he's dealing with. God is not ignorant of what he is doing. God is going to use the Babylonians and he knows full well who they are in all of their gory, evil nastiness. He goes on and on. They sweep across the whole earth and seize dwellings not their own. They're feared and dreadful people. They're a law unto themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. It goes on and on and on. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at fortified cities, building earth and ramps to capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose strength is their God. That is slightly frightening if you are Habakkuk. What have I unleashed? What did I do? I called out to God. This isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I meant. What do you think Habakkuk is feeling? What, what is he thinking here? As he hears God's plan to deal with the evil and the injustice and the brokenness in Judah by sicking the Babylonians on them. Well, Habakkuk starts out in verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. First of all, Habakkuk gets this right. When he's coming back to answer God, hearing what God has in mind, he shows a little respect. But then we see what's deep down inside of Habakkuk, which probably is not a great surprise if you think about what he has just heard from God. He says in the second part of verse 12, Lord, you, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to, to punish. He's incredulous. He's absolutely incredulous. Them of all people? Why not just get like a good king to come in and clean house? Why not get a few good priests, a good politician or two and straighten this mess? You're going to use them? He's absolutely astounded. Your eyes, verse 13, are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. In other words, God, this makes no sense. How could you do such a thing? This makes no sense. And, and the final part of verse 13, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? In other words, how can you do this? You can't do this. Habakkuk is upset because God, the way that he's going to address the evil and the injustice in Judah is to punish them using an evil people. And these are a people that really are, 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 are more evil than, than these righteous ones that, that, that God, that Habakkuk is asking to be straightened out. It's, it's, it's unthinkable. It's really, really unthinkable. Um, and then you, you read 14 through 17. Um, it, it, here, this kind of echoes God was God was really recognizing and acknowledging how bad 
bad the Babylonians are here, it's kind of like Habakkuk parroting that back and saying, yeah, these, these people, you made people like fish in the sea, like the sea creatures have no rules. The wicked foe pulls them all up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. He sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Is this really, is this really what you mean to happen? Is this really the way you want to work this out? Habakkuk ends, beginning of chapter 2. I'll stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. It's almost like, all right, God, go ahead. Explain it. I'm waiting. How am I supposed to explain this? This doesn't make sense. I'm watching what you're doing. Then the Lord answers. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it for the revelation awaits in an appointed time. It speaks to the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. See, certainly it will certainly come and it will not and it will not this and it will not delay. Basically, God's word to Habakkuk. Habakkuk is wound up. Habakkuk is incredulous. He can't believe it. Basically, God's word to Habakkuk is you need to be patient. Hold your horses. You need to be patient and see what I'm doing. It's going to take time. The revelation awaits for an appointed time. It speaks of the end. It will not prove false. It's going to happen. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. You need to be patient. I've got this under control. Wait, be patient, and see what I will do. Verse 4, see the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. In other words, God is saying to Habakkuk, I do see them for who they are. I may get to be used them, but they won't get away with it. I know them. Be patient. Now, here in verse 4b, you might want to underline this one in your Bible. Be curious if you picked up a pew Bible, if it's already underlined, because I told him to do it in the first service. So if you're using a pew Bible, underline it there. It'll be a gift for the next person who looks at this. Verse 4b, just a tiny, tiny little bit of hope. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Habakkuk is so so upset and so wound up by all that he sees is wrong in Judah. And now God sees that and God is going to do something about it. The only thing is that Habakkuk doesn't want any part of what God is proposing to do about it. And so Habakkuk is wound up even more and God is trying to assure him and to reassure him. Calm down. Wait for it. It'll be okay. I've got this. Here's what you need to do. The righteous live by faithfulness. What can Habakkuk do about what God is doing? What can Habakkuk do about all the evil and the injustice that's going on in Judah? Nothing. What can Habakkuk do? He can live by faithfulness. That is his part. Faith will be rewarded. I want you to say that with me. Faith will be rewarded. <clears throat> Hold that thought. Now, God right away, he right away goes back to the enemy and to those who are evil and he's indicting them. He sees all the kind of things that they're doing. Wine betrays him. He's arrogant. He's greedy. The grave death is never satisfied. He gathers the nations. He takes captives. God is right back to condemning Babylon now, the very tool that he's going to use to punish Judah. But then in verse 6, 
just as God is really starting to get rolling with this. Verse 6 says, Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn? In other words, Habakkuk, you're not the only one that sees this. Everybody else sees it too. Do you ever, do you ever find yourself in the midst of something and it seems so wrong, so obviously wrong, and you are incensed and you are just flipping out inside. Maybe you're flipping out outside as well. And it seems like nobody else gets it. That makes it twice as bad, doesn't it? But when you start to find one person that sees what you see, when you start to find two people that understand what you see, when you start to have a few more people that get it, it hasn't changed what's going on, but somehow it's a little bit better because you're not crazy, you're not reading it wrong, someone else is on your side. And God is telling Habakkuk, look, Babylon is wrong, it's evil, and guess what? There's going to come a time everybody's going to get it. And then he really, really gets wound up here. The next section, next several verses from 6 down to about 17 are God alternating between indictment against Babylon and the punishment that they will get. I took a, a red highlighter for indictment and I took a blue highlighter or a blue pen for, um, for punishment uh, through this next section and almost every line, almost every verse is underlined here because God just starts bam, 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 bam. All these things that they are doing and they are going to get it. Babylon will not escape unscathed. God sees them. He'll use them, but they will not escape. He sees them for who they are and what they are. And we get down to about the middle of verse 16, and it really ramps up. Uh, the cup of the Lord's right hand is coming around to you. Disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you've done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities, and everyone in them and then the absolute kicker 18 and 19 maybe maybe by this point God thinks that somebody in Babylon who hears this message might start to be getting a little bit worried but if they're worried what are they going to do they're going to turn to their gods right they're going to turn to 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 their gods God says, what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies for the one who makes it trust in his own creation? He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood come to life or to lifeless stone wake up. Can it give guidance? Is it covered with gold and silver? There's no breath in it. Basically, Babylon, Babylon, <laughs> you've had it good. You've had it your way. You're in trouble, and you have no hope. There is nowhere you can turn. You cannot turn to anyone or anything else. No, quote-unquote, God can save you. Verse 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. Essentially, I have spoken. That's mom or dad putting down their foot. The final word at home. Dad, Mom, can we? No, but, what, but, but, but. No. God puts down his foot on the Babylonians. There's nothing else that can be said. This is how it will be. Now, before we turn to Habakkuk's prayer, I just want to pause here a little bit. If we're to go back to where we began, where Habakkuk began crying out to God against evil in Judah about violence, injustice, wrongdoing, destruction, strife, and conflict, where verse 4 says the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Any of you wonder, could this be written about today? 
all the injustice, all of the violence, all of the wrongdoing, all of the destruction, all of the strife that we see, could this be written about today? It sure seems like it could be. And when you consider in Habakkuk how the cure seems worse than the, the sickness in Habakkuk, it was to bring in the Babylonians to straighten out Judah. Today, it seems like the, the cure that we have to fix the ills in the world is, well, more politicians and more parties and more people in power, more companies in power, more movements in power, promising to come along and to help or to change. Just listen to me and things will get better. Do it this way and all will be well. How can it be that these folks that oftentimes were the very cause of the ills and the oppression that we face today, how are they going to make it better just by saying so? How can they turn it around just because? This really feels to me, in Habakkuk, like what we are experiencing so much today. If we keep that in mind, think about Habakkuk, consider his position and the power of Habakkuk personally to bring about real change in Judah. Even when it was so desperately needed, though he spoke the truth and did share God's word with any who would listen and hopefully heed, what power did he really have to change things? You have to conclude he really didn't have anything that he could do to change all that he saw that was wrong. And similarly today, we're in a similar position with all that is violent and unjust, wrongdoing, destruction, strife, conflict, with all that is evil. And not just in the big picture, but the small pictures too. I mean, do, do we really have the power to change these kind of forces? I'm not sure that we do have the power to change those forces, but we can't ignore them either. We cannot close our eyes and let them blindly go on. What do we do? If you missed it or forgot it already, buried in all that book, all that back and forth, chapter 1 and chapter 2, God gave Habakkuk something to do. Something that is just as important for today as it was back then. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4b. But the righteous person will live by his righteousness. That idea, the righteous person will live by his righteousness, is at once a present direction and a future promise. We live by faith now. Is the world wrong now? Yes, we do. What do we do? We live by faith. And eventually, no matter what, no matter how wrong the world is now, eventually we will live by faith, having passed through all that is wrong now, trusting that God will eventually right all the wrongs, especially those that are bigger than ourselves. This message is so relevant today, and it's doubly so when we consider us in the beginning of the season of Advent. Advent, that season when we prepare for and look ahead to the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah who came because bad as things were in Habakkuk's time, it kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. In the end, it wasn't enough for Judah to be disciplined by God at the hands of the Babylonians. In the end, evil and sin were so pervasive, God would have to come personally to provide a way for healing, for wholeness, for life. The way that God chose to act took time to unfold. It didn't happen all at once. While God's plan unfolded, God's faithful still lived amidst the evil, amidst all kinds of evil. What must they do? What were they to do? Live by faithfulness. As we wait in this short season of preparation, remembering what God is doing, we live by faithfulness. We endure the darkness to get to the light. Really, this is not just good advice, but it is godly advice all year long. Because even with the coming of the Messiah so long ago, today God's kingdom, God's kingdom operates side by side with the kingdom of the world. It is not yet time. Not yet time for the fulfillment of God's kingdom when all else will be swept away. And so in Advent and out of Advent, 
We live by faithfulness every day. What does that mean? That means every day we should be about seeking God, praying, searching the scriptures, communing with God, applying the word of God as we understand it to our lives. We should be living it out for all to see. And when we're all by ourselves, loving, serving, worshiping, forgiving, blessing, and so on. No matter the outcome of our actions, we do what we can, what we know of God, knowing that this pleases Him. Despite all that we are surrounded by, and, and even despite our own doubts and uncertainties about what or how God might choose, Habakkuk wasn't certain, despite our doubts and uncertainties about what or how God might choose to do what God will do, we choose to act in faith. Habakkuk expresses that so well in the last part of his book. And here I would have you go home and read through it. But Habakkuk's prayer, the whole chapter 3, begins in praise, lengthy praise of God who is over all. God who is over the earth. God who has power over the nations. Great and terrible power over the nations. But God who, in verse 13 we see has the power to save. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot, and so on. Finally, look at how this prayer ends. Verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Let me paraphrase that a little bit. What is Habakkuk praying? In the end, he's praying his resolve. His resolve that no matter what, no matter how bad it might get, he will walk by faith. He will trust. Brothers and sisters, the righteous person will live by faith. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you and we ask that you would impress your word, all of your word, upon our hearts. Today, Father, help us, help us to hear and to accept that your desire for us in all circumstances, even the difficult ones, is to walk by faith. And then, Lord, help us to do just that. Help us as we make our way throughout our days to walk by faith, honoring and glorifying you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our worship.